Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today on Beauty Talks. Uh, at yet another Sunday evening. Uh, so welcome back again. Today's topic is about uh, are you in the right business? I'm Hazir, your lecturer. Now, starting these lectures with a uh, question straight away. This question means, uh, otherwise this question makes sense that if you already have a business in hand, if you are into some business, what is your business? That's the question. However, I assume there are people, they have intentions to start some new business so that you have still got chance to decide the right business for you. Or otherwise, if you are already in the business, you may have to think about the business contacts and you may need to take an exit from what you do and then you may have to start another, the right one for you as well. So we'll have a discussion on this and we'll see how it goes. Now, before I go for the main topic, let me tell you the key message that I'm talking about business and the guys, uh, whoever I deal with, most of them are students and they all have uh, jobs, they all work. In my language, I'm calling these uh, employees the modern day slaves. Uh, the reason is because uh, they pay you uh, at the slavery of the employees. That is what it happens because you don't have any independence. You don't have time independence. You don't have location independence. You don't have financial independence. You don't have family independence. In terms of independence, whatever the terms that you need them at, you don't have it. Example, if you want to take your wife to consult the VOG, the gynecologist for your baby's delivery, you need to get the permission from your boss. The boss denies you the permission. You will not attend to that appointment. You need to change the date of your appointment to the doctor. This is why I'm calling this modern day slavery. You don't have any independence to decide when to take your family to the doctors, when to go on your holiday. So the money you earn out of this slavery is what I'm calling is looking like begging something. Okay, because you don't have any saying strongly on the payment that you need to get. The boss counts the money and gives it to you. When I'm calling business, you earn profit, not the salary where the profit is so beautiful and you do a deal with your business partner. There is no boss. You don't go to the workplace, you go to your marketplace in the morning to do the deal. So this is about business, where your earning is unlimited. The more you want, the more you can. It is highly possible. And there is risk involved in if you don't do the right thing correctly at the right time. However, it is what I'm talking about. The reason is, I am promoting this business context for all my students if they do some MBAs from us. It's because the ultimate objective of your learning of your MBA is starting a business, not to work for the organization again, not to go for some promotion with some uh, extra money, not to uh, find a country to migrate with a certificate, no. You have to start your business. If you start your business, your business doesn't have any geographical borders, any uh, immigration borders, you may be located in one place, your location is independent, but you'll be having customers all over the world. Now, I'm having customers for my business all over the world, and I don't, uh, nobody knows where I am, in fact. That is what business is about. If you have business, you are everywhere. Now, this business has one good uh, characteristics. It is the property of your family. In other terms, I would call it, it is a heritage. It is an inheritable stuff of your family because when you die, that business will be automatically transferred to your family members, your kids, your wife, your family members, that is yours. But if you are in a great job earning loads of money, they will replace your job when you die before your funeral takes place. They will get someone else, they will replace you before your funeral takes place. That is why job is not yours. When you die, job is gone, but your business will still be existing. So that is why I'm always promoting business than a job. Now, we know why a business is about. Uh, and again, I have a reason to start a business here. You start a business for monetary reasons mainly. You never start a business because fun. You never start a business because you have money. You never start a business, you have enough time to spend with, no. You start a business because to earn some money. So you should not let the business to consume from you, but you should consume as much as you can from your business. You should consume money from it. You should consume extra time from it. You should consume holidays from it. You should consume leisure from it. 
you should consume whatever that gives you pleasure out of your business as much as you can. That is when it is a business. If the business consumes things from you, you don't have a business, you have an expensive hobby. That is what we call it. If your business consumes from you, that takes all of your time, that takes all of your money, that takes all of your energy, that gives you loads of trauma and tension. It is not business, it is consuming from you. So we need a business. When we have a business, we always uh, need a bulk of money, lump sum of money. So we need money. We need this money whenever we want. Let's say we need some money for an emergency tomorrow. You should be able to draw it from your business. You should not say that the business is running at a loss. The business doesn't have any cash flow. I don't have money. And you're not in a business. You're in an expensive hobby. So we need to consume. We need to withdraw. We need to... Uh, draw money from uh, the business at any time we want. And the second uh, time, the second uh, context that you withdraw, or you draw money from your business is every month, monthly, on a fixed date, you should draw some money to your pocket from your business. That is the second uh, context. Third is about annually, when you file your tax, when you file your Back, when you declare your profit, when you pay your tax, you need to take loads of money home at the end of each year, annual drawings. And you should keep on doing this whenever you want money at the end of each month and at the end of each year. On top of this, when you are feeling I am done with this money, I don't need this business anymore, your business should be ready to be sold to someone your business. Now you see, WhatsApp has gone for sale for Facebook. Facebook purchased WhatsApp. Elon Musk purchased uh, Twitter for $44 billion. It's it's uh, already sold. And uh, Skype was sold. Uh, Safeway was sold. So many companies were sold because at the end of the business, your business is in a position, in a context that anybody can buy and run the business. That is why you need to build a business at the end of the business, if you don't want to continue, if you want to retire, that business should have a huge market value that can be sold to someone in the market who is looking to purchase a business. Now, most of the times, the business we build, when we are tired, when we don't need that business, what we do, we shut the business down. We close the business down. That is not right. That is not the right business again. Because you built that business for over the last 10, 20 years, when you don't want the business, that business doesn't have anything. Nobody there to buy that business. That is when I'm calling it is not a business. The business you build over the last 20 years, it should have loads of brand value. It should have loads of customer base in that. It should have loads of customers. They keep coming regularly on a regular basis, daily basis. That is when it is a business. So at the end of the business, if you want to retire, if you want to get rid of the business, you sell that business for a huge price then it is a business. So we need a business of this kind. We don't need any other business. If the business consumes from you, I call it the business is uh, a, an expensive hobby for you. We don't need that kind of hobby because we have loads of other hobbies that we could enjoy without any tension, trauma, and that kind of thing. So the next question is what I'm going to answer. That's the main topic. What business are you in? Or what business do you have an intention with to start in the near future? Now, for this, I'm trying to get about four people's opinion on this. Number one, we all know uh, Warren Buffett, hedge fund manager, uh, one of the billionaires in the world, uh, few times the richest in the world as well. According to his advice, he says, don't do what you don't know. If you don't know it, don't do it. If you don't have any idea about what's happening, don't do it. What he says is, in a chess board, don't be a chess piece. You have to be the player because the chess piece doesn't know what's happening. It goes uh, back and forth. It get moved from left to right top to bottom and so on, but it doesn't know why, where, nothing. Again, the same story of a football. You get kicked from all the sides. You go from this goal post to that goal post, that end to this end, and you don't know why. You get kicked from all the sides, and you don't know why that you are getting kicked, and you don't know where you are going to. So you got to be the player in the ground, not the football. 
that is what he means don't do anything if you don't know it so if you want to start a business you should know the business in and out otherwise don't that is what he says whereas one of my greatest mentor uh dane pino uh his advice is if you want to start a business you don't need to know the business if you know that business has the profit potential you can start the business he exemplified himself that he was starting a business uh oil petroleum business and he said when he was starting it there were so many petroleum tycoons in the world and they were supplying petrol for decades 15 20 years one two decades of business experience i was starting my business i don't know where to buy the oil can i don't know where to dig those where to drill those how to sell those how to buy those how to cash it up how to transport how to store i knew nothing and i started it within 3 4 years i was overtaking all those tycoons operating for more than 20 years in the business uh very successfully so he says any business you want to start if you know that business has the profit potential start it but you have to be fast enough to learn you should know much more things than your competitors so you should shortcut your learnings you should fast track your learnings learn the business quickly that is what his advice is about so these two guys have the contradictory advice one on buff says uh, don't start what you don't know uh, dan says uh, dan says you can start if you even don't know it and i tell you one very first hand example here to uh, go with Warren Buffs statement this guy is Mr Raj from India and he was one of the business uh, magnates in the country in 2000 early 2000 2005 6 that period and he was based in uh, Coimbatore in India and this is this guy was one of those guys uh, the government had uh, given the license to operate private jets private passenger jets for aeroplanes to carry passengers like spicy jet kingfisher of vijay malya those kind of thing so you can understand the wealth of this guy this guy was having different business from international school to universities from manufacturing to uh, construction every business you name it he was having it a big business man and he, he his idea was if you know uh, the business that has the profit potential you start it you don't need to know the business what happened unfortunately he wanted to buy a loss making insurance company operating in india and he purchased the company because of that only company's insurance liability to their customers he had to lose everything what he was having in his hand he was uh, filing bankruptcy for every single company finally he had to leave the country and he wanted to seek asylum economical asylum in the uk so he went from india to the uk that is when i got to know the guy so here the advice is in line with warren buff so we never start a business which you don't know and again i have another new story that is from twitter mr elon musk and his new ceo linda yakarino now elon musk purchased twitter for 44 billion about 6 months ago and 6 months of time he was a ceo of the company and the company has lost about 2 billion dollars worth of value within this 6 months time now he immediately realized that i am not the right ceo here so he hired this new ceo linda yakar you know uh, she is the new ceo of twitter from last week onwards very recent appointment because he himself consulted him that i don't know about social media industry let me get someone who knows it so again he is in line with ronald buff so according to the studies that i have done searching for people's industry it is strongly advised if you know the business only you start it don't start a business based on the opinion because you look at one business the business is running you then you you say okay this is a good business let me start it and you start it and you fail okay that's why always start a business if you know it uh 
but you know there are certain businesses that you can start because uh, there is a profit potential if that is the case you get to be like these guys now there are three guys in here bill gates warren buff mark zuckerberg you know all of these guys if i ask you one thing uh, come on for all these three guys you would say all are americans all are business people all are multi-billionaires fine but only one thing that they have in their life that make them successful business people is their commitment to learn. They are committed to learning things, all the things, new things, new developments they track. Bill Gates reads about 50 books a year. Warren Buff reads about six hours a day. Out of his eight hour, nine hour days, 80% of the time he reads things. He reads about six, seven newspapers daily. And Mark Zuckerberg, he reads about different cultures in the world because he can develop his Facebook uh, there. An average person in the world, they read about uh, two books a year. An average CEO reads about four to six books a month, meaning the CEOs are committed to learning new things. If you are committed to learn new things, you can start a business which you don't know because Every business that you think of, if that has the profit potential, you can start it. As soon as you can learn the business, you will be able to run the business. So you can start the business if you don't even know, as long as you are ready to learn about it very quickly. Now, that's fine. You can start a business which you know or which you don't know. However, the weight of your business, I'm calling the weight of a business in two different terms. Number one, a lightweight business. Number two, a heavyweight business, an elephant kind of thing. The lightweight business is about some business that has very less customers, but very high profits. Very less customers, but very high profit because the profit margin is very high. You do one sales. Let's say if you are a uh, estate agent, if you do one sales a year, that year's one sales would be enough uh, to cover all of your expenses, all of the salaries, all of your profits. One sales, only one deal, one customer, but that is enough for you sometimes. So that is what I'm talking about. Very light business. You, you run on the business for years, for, a, for the whole year. You have only one headache, one customer, or one project. You do it and you get the business done. So this is what I'm calling lightweight business, like a little pigeon. If you like the pigeon, you keep it. If you don't like the pigeon, you can sell that for, any, for anyone. There are so many people to buy it because very lightweight maintenance of a pigeon is very easy. Maintenance of a business like this pigeon is very easy. So you can get it off it. You keep it or you get it off it. You can sell it. If you don't have anyone to sell it, you can let the pigeon fly. You can close it down. There's no problem. There's no big loss on it. But if it is an elephant, you got to keep it. You can't turn this to any other different direction. If you have one business, you can't make that business into something else. So you have to get it of it. If you bring this to the market to sell it, there's no one to purchase because looking after an elephant is not easy. You need to have proper license. You need to have proper uh, place to keep it, uh, food, uh, the, the person to look after that. There are so many costs involved and it's difficult to get rid of it, to sell it. So I'm talking about a business very lightweight. When I say lightweight, the operation is very light. You have power steering. It takes very less petrol, but it can carry too many passengers. It can carry too many passengers. It can carry uh, too much of profit in it. That's what it means. Now look at this, Alibaba.com, Facebook, Airbnb. They are very light businesses. Alibaba doesn't have any inventory, but they have uh, lacks of things sold on their platform. Facebook, they have their platform. They never produce anything. All the contents on the Facebook is developed by the people. Airbnb is the largest hotel in the world, but they own no real estate, no factories, no properties. Booking.com owns no hotel. Amazon sells the other's products, not theirs. eBay, the same story. So, the lightweight business is here. There are manufacturers. You don't choose to be a manufacturer. Don't do that. Okay. You only need to be here, a lightweight marketing company, lightweight uh, high ticket closing company. That is what you do. Manufacturers, they manufacture. Construction companies, they construct hotels and, and apartments and houses. What you do, you find a customer and you sell it. 
you would be making more money than the manufacturers in many cases. Now, you see, farmers, they, they put their blood inside the farm. They do loads of hard work under the heavy sunny days. Now, when you take the profit, when the farming uh, farmed crops reach the customers, if you, if you see the, the profit that was distributed among the farmer and the other parties involved in, in that supply chain, the end seller, the stockist of them, the purchasing company from the farmers to sell that to the consumer, they earn a lot of money, but their energy is spent very less. That is what I'm talking about. Okay, lightweight business. The business doesn't have much to do. You don't have much of a risk and you make still good profit. So you need to choose a lightweight business for yourself. Now, there are businesses that we have learned which is uh, profit-driven or revenue-driven. When I say revenue-driven, your business will be earning loads of money. You get loads of revenue, but the profit is very less. If you take one IT company, they may have one license sold for the year, one software sold for the year. And if you take one of the supermarkets, they have sales every single day, thousands of customers, thousands of cash inside the till every day, thousands of checks to be cleared in the morning and so much of stock, so much of deliveries, so much of uh, uh, stocks, so much of inventory, you name it, so much of employees and stuff and they get loads of revenue. But if you calculate the profit you make at the end of the year and the profit the software company makes end of the year after one sales, the profit of the software company may be greater than the profit of a uh, supermarket. That is why you take Uber here, a good example. They started the company in 2009. And since 2014, they never made any profitable year. They made loss, total loss of the rest of the years that counts 25 billion. This company has 32,800 employees and they have 118 million users in 2021. It may be more now. So heavyweight business, 32,800 employees, 118 million users, and you never had a profitable year after 2014. Now, this is what I'm calling revenue driven. They are getting loads of millions of dollars daily, but that is paid back again to their uh, drivers and the rest of the employees and the rest of the things to be uh, paid. So this is what I'm calling revenue driven. The profit driven business is about you focus on the profit, not on the revenue. Whatever the money comes in, 80% of the money has to go to your pocket. That is profit driven. Whatever the money that comes in. Always the revenue driven businesses, only 20% or 15% comes to your pocket. 80%, 85% goes out again to bear the cost. Profit driven is about you, you take 80% to your pocket and 20% goes out to bear the cost of it. So a good example, Uber, owned by Google and one of the biggest taxi companies in the world. And they are running at a loss, in fact. So I tell you this message in here. You, you have to reduce customer numbers as much as you can, but you have to increase the profits. That is when the business is light and you can earn enough money in it. Now, when you do this mathematics, if you want to earn, $10,000 profit or sales. Uh, you need to, you have two calculation in here. One is one customer, $10,000 customer or 10 customer, $1,000 customers. One $10,000 customer or 10 $1,000 customers. If you have it, you can get $10,000. One $10,000 customer may pay you $10,000 or 10 $1,000 customers can pay the same amount of money. But if you compare these two, if it is the big customer, high volume customer, $10,000 customer, he would pay you that money, one customer, one headache, everything is one, and you make the profit out of it. 
But if it is 10 customers into $1,000, 10 headaches, 10 delivery, 10 maintenance, 10 after sale services, 10 customer services, every single thing is 10. When you take these all, there are one customer involved in, in $10,000, and there are 10 customers involved in $1,000 in business. Now, if you compare the effort you do to these two different businesses, the effort you do to convince the customer to purchase the things from you for $10,000, it is almost 10,000 easier than 10,000, 10 customers, $10,000, $1,000, 10 customers. Okay, so it is much easier to convince a rich customer than a poor customer. So, so this is again making your business very light. Don't focus to these poor customers, always focus to premium customers star customers so the profit margin is very high your headache is very less you can get more profit easy efforts but it is not that possible for you to increase the price to the product ten thousand dollar instead of one thousand dollar where well, what you need to do is you have to increase the value of your product as as much as you increase as much as the value is increased you will be able to get the price uh, increased and you can easily get the customers to pay purchase that is why i always advise my clients to go for ten thousand dollar customers than one thousand dollar customer it is easy to deal with them go with high profit uh, customers it's easy to deal with them now so i have said two, three points in here, how to make your deals easy, how to make your business light here. Let me tell you this example. It is about the hospital industry, uh, healthcare industry. So here we have so much of uh, activities involved in now. You have ambulance services to pick the passenger from home and drop them off in the hospital. That is one business, there are ambulance services they are around, they can pick passengers from home and they can drop them uh, at hospital. So that is one business. And when the patient is admitted to the hospital, hospital has the doctors, consultants, nursing services, ward facilities, pharmacy facilities, blood tests, and all these investigation things that happens in hospital. Okay, those are all within the hospital. After the patient is treated, you can send the patient back again, maybe another ambulance, or if the patient died in the hospital, maybe an ambulance to bring the body down to home. Now, I learned one message about a month ago where one of my friend's sister died and she died in the city and they wanted to transport the body, to send the body home. It's about 400 kilometers away from the city. For that, they charged about 2,500 sterling pounds worth of that country's currency to, to transfer. In the ambulance, there was a doctor and a nurse. Okay, now look at the profit of this to travel 450 kilometers around. The ambulance charged about 2,500. It costs around nine and a half lakhs in Sri Lankan rupees to transport the body, to bring the body from the hospital to his hometown to take the funeral. Now you see, these two businesses, ambulance transfer business and the hospital business, if you compare these two, this business is so light. Most of the hospitals, they don't have the services. They have the ambulance to transfer passengers uh, from one hospital to another, fine, but not to transfer the, the dead body, not to pick the passengers. If you can pick this, this is lightweight. Only one ambulance you have to buy, and you may have to hire or, or, or employ a driver there. And you may have the database of multiple nurses and doctors on that particular day of business. You can call one of the doctors and say, can you accompany this body to the city, go by ambulance and come back by the same ambulance within about eight hours time. And I pay this amount of money. If you have 20 doctors in your database of your phone, you can pick one doctor who is off on that particular day. If you pay some fat money, he will do that for you. He'll be still making lakhs of profit there. And if you have 20 nurses in your, in your phone, you pick one of the nurses and you tell the nurse to accompany the body. She would go with the doctor and the ambulance driver and they will come back. Okay, so this is lightweight. Now, this same industry has lots of other functions as well. Uh, medical tourism. If you can't get the treatment from 
the city you live in, you can bring these passengers to these, these patients to some other different country. You can provide them with certain services. Now, I heard people from Middle East, they come to uh, Park Royal Hospital London, they come to many other hospitals in UK, they go to USA, they go to Singapore for certain treatments which is not available, which is not in the right quality in Middle East. So they go there and they don't know where to go, how to go. The traveling, the lodging, the supply of food, all those things, consulting a doctor, they know nothing. Or sometimes they know, but they need some assistance. And that is another business that is happening in the world. Massive, it has a worth uh, in multiple dollars. Now on the other side, these hospitals, they need uh, nurses. Now, these hospitals can run a nursing school inside. I know hospitals in, in cities, they have nursing schools inside. They put the nurses to practice inside and they produce nurses. And those nurses, when they are qualified, they work for another two years uh, or one year for this internship. Then they move from their country to some other country to migrate for a higher price. So that training also can be given and it is lightweight, okay? To run this uh, nursing school, you don't need to have a hospital. You only need to have a, a online teaching program. You tie up with one of the hospitals so you can send those students to learn nursing, to practice nursing inside. You give the theoretical part in your Zoom session and you get them trained in the hospital and they are qualified nurses in one of the years time. Caretakers, again, you can train caretakers there. That is another business, very lightweight compared to a hospital. If you want to involve in this, Healthcare industry, you don't need to have a hospital. You can have ambulance services. You can have medical tourism. You can have nursing school. You can have caretaker schools. You can have e-channeling applications. Okay, you have multiple doctors around the city. There are multiple hospitals provide the same consultation facilities for specific disease. And you don't know who is online, who is where. If you go through this app, one of those, you have e-channeling apps in every country almost. You can run those companies lightweight, get some doctor's database, and you know where they are. You charge the patient, you make the appointment for them. The patient go to the hospital and they consult the doctor and other business. And uh, the healthcare tech or technology-based hospitals where there are apps these days, you can consult doctors through video conferencing. You don't need to go to the hospital physically. You can meet your doctor online. You can open your video. You can show the patient. You can show all of your symptoms in the camera. Doctors can consult you. You can do all the investigations. Hospitals can send you the, the uh, assistance to collect the sample of your blood and urine and whatever they want to take sample of. And you are relaxing at your home. They send the treatment, send the prescription, send the medicine to your home. These are deals by IT platforms. And this can be another lightweight business because you don't need any brick and mortars in here. You don't need 25 floor buildings. You don't need 25,000 uh, employees. You don't need to have about 128 beds inside. You don't need to have 2,000 car parts outside. No, you don't need any of those, but it will still be making the same money, almost the better money as of them. And medical insurance, health insurance, there are options, the waste management, there are options. There are so many options inside hospitals. And based on the, the discussion we had before, I tell you one thing, out of these options, which option do you pick if you want to start a business in healthcare sector? What area that looks light for you, take it. If you know it, it's easy. If you don't know it, uh, be like Dane, uh, Pina, learn the business immediately as possible and you kick off to your business, okay? So that is an idea. Anything you wanted to, you can. And I picked as a university, as a college, I picked this business and this business. We're going to train nurses and caretakers in our college and we're going to have tie-ups with hospitals where we put these nurses to practice their nursing practices. After that, they get qualified and they can leave the country. They can leave the hospital to some other different hospital. They can look into their own career pathway. That's up to them. So that is, again, another idea because it's lightweight for us. Now, let me discuss another, another area that we can discuss because uh, for these new business ventures. Now, I did this research on this KSA's uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030. Their vision is to bring 10 million 
visitors by 2030 to Saudi because they're trying to diversify their income from oil to some other different source of income. So they're mainly targeting tourism. So they wanted to build a country. Okay, this vision is not going to end in 2030. They're going to extend this vision for another 10 years. So it's going to be for another 20 years, Saudi will be open for you for business. Okay, the economic growth of 2022 was 8.7% 8, 8 in that. 5.4% of the growth was from non-oil sector. So you can understand they are growing in non-oil sector faster than the oil sector. Okay, so they're diversifying it. And Saudi is having the lowest ever employment rate in the history of Saudi last year. And they have 36% women workforce contribution to the growth of the country. So we can understand Women has opportunities now, females, because they were limited to access to work before. That was the law. Now the law is relaxed and you can enter into workplace, you can do business, you can do jobs and so on. So women are welcome there to work, to work. And Saudi is the fastest growing economy within G20 countries in year 2022. So based on all of this, uh, we can see the reaction of other companies. Now, at the moment, Saudi Arabia has 42,033 keys, meaning 42,033 42, hotel rooms in the, in, the, in the country. And that is 34.1% of the region. So you can understand one more than one third of the hotel facilities are based in Saudi. Uh, that is even more than Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE, Qatar, Oman, Lebanon, uh, all those countries, uh, nearby countries. Saudi has this one third, more than one third of the hotel keys with them in the country. And they're trying to build this capacity to 1,000, I'm sorry, 100,000 keys, 100,000 rooms uh, in uh, before or by the end of 2030. Now to do this, they have lots of agreements with multiple brands, minor hotels. They are from uh, uh, Thailand. So they, they have contracts with them to build mountain villas, mountain in mountains, uh, rich resorts and villas. And uh, they wanted to do this uh, health sector, the, the, the health treatment uh, uh, properties and some city properties as well. And Hyatt Hotel America, they have a lots of uh, hotels already running and they want to build more hotels in there. If you take reasons, they have hotels in, uh, Saudi older, they have 25 running hotels, 25 hotels are under construction and they have another 50 hotels coming up within the next five years time. So by the end of uh, 2028, 20, 2030, they're going to have 100 hotels in the city. And meantime, Rotana from uh, UAE, they have signed a contract with MEMA. Is the construction company and Rotana Hotels, they have signed a contract with them to build five hotels for them in Saudi Arabia. So this is a story of uh, the hotels in Saudi Arabia where so many IT companies from India, from Egypt, they're entering into the country. The, the property companies, they're entering from some other countries to this country because the property uh, market in Saudi Arabia is worth $100 billion. And we are expecting about 100 to 200 growth in the property price in five years time. Okay, so companies are entering here. Now, the Beverly Hills CEO was around in the city to have some exploration to find some opportunities for uh, Beverly Hills in Saudi Arabia. Czech Republic finance minister was uh, with uh, his 15 delegates in Saudi Arabia to learn things. And uh, Bryce is sending footballers to play for uh, KSA teams to develop this entertainment industry. Uh, India is sending their business people. Yuz Valley is walking inside. He's older to that little uh, hypermarket. They're older to that. They're expanding it. Landmarks group, uh, Renuka, Yagdiani is entering and they're expanding their business. Uh, they're from India. Danu, uh, the building material company, he's Rizwan, he is from India as well they're all entering into the market to expand their business, existing business. Okay, Landmark Group is entering, Danib is entering or expanding, Lulu is entered, has already entered, they're, they're expanding their business. Because when you expect about 
100 billion visitors to the country, you need to supply all those uh, essentials they need. You need to supply houses, apartments, accommodation. You need to supply uh, uh, the, the consumer goods, all these foods, milk, all those basic things. So you need to have these kind of people there as well. So India is mainly sending business tycoons to support Saudi Arabia uh, uh, change this, this vision. So when these things are happening in Saudi Arabia, we can see uh, how can you be part of this driving change in Saudi Arabia? You can enter into some IT sector, aviation sector, real estate sector, education sector, food sector, taxi, transportation sector. There are so many other sectors as well. All of these sectors has its brick and mortar, heavyweight business part with that. You have the lightweight business as well. If you want to carry passenger from London to Saudi Arabia for a holiday, you don't need to own an aircraft. You don't need to be uh, Vijay Malia. You don't need to be spicy jet. You don't need to be British Airways. You need to be a small little company running from your backyard to bring passengers on board. So that is lightweight. To run this taxi company in Saudi Arabia, you don't need to own these cars and the drivers. If you have a little app there to pick the passengers, it is, yes, enough. When I say real estate, you don't need to own any real estate uh, properties on your own name. If you have the properties owned by some others, you can bring the customers to those properties. Service apartments, there are concepts, so we can. And again, education industry. To do all of this work, if you are about construction, you need engineers. If you are about tourism, you need a tourism specialist. You need chefs. You need uh, hospitality, uh, customer service assistants. You need hoteliers. You need waiters. You need managers. You need loads of different people. You can train all of those people. When you definitely bring in these 100 million visitors to Saudi Arabia, definitely you will have uh, elders visit in the country as well. So healthcare sector, you need more doctors, you need more nurses, you need more caretakers, you need more hospitals. Again, when you talk about food, food is short supplied in the world. That is why everywhere food is expensive. Today's news, uh, the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak has made a suggestion, um, is in talk with the supermarkets in the UK to cap the price, to set the maximum price for basic food items in the country because the problem is food inflation, very high price for food, very high, very expensive. So he's in, he's in talks with these supermarkets to put the price, cap the price to a certain level so that you can afford, the people can afford to purchase. And UK's visa system is very difficult. It is difficult for you to bring in outsiders to work for UK. But today, the Home Office has uh, approved to bring in fishermen from other countries to do fishing for Indian, uh, for, for British uh, people uh, from the British uh, Sea. So they are allowing visa processes easily. They have made it easy. If you have these, these fishermen elsewhere, you can bring them down so they can bring some fish to the market so we can manage these food prices. So the food supply. If you take Saudi Arabia, most of the food sold in Saudi Arabia is uh, imported. They're all imported. There is no local production there. So you don't need to be a farmer to produce food. There are farmers producing food in the village of every country. You can bring those food lightweight. You do one consignment, that is it. When the consignment is done, you're off. If you want another consignment, again, another consignment. So you purchase it from one country and you purchase, you send that to Saudi Arabia and you, you can have your business, but very lightweight compared to a big school, big rental employment and so on. So based on this, I have a question for you. So what business are you in or what business do you want to be in? I have done the analysis for Saudi Arabia. I have done that analysis for a hospital or healthcare industry, and you can do an analysis of your choice of the business, every business, it has the heavyweight part and the lightweight part. And I strongly suggest you to go for the lightweight part to start the business. And again, if you have money, you can throw the money into the heavyweight part and you can play a gamble. If you get the money, fine. If you don't get the money, there's no problem that way. So my final question, what business do you want to be in? 
Thank you very much for joining me today on this lecture. And I see you again on BD Talks next week. Have a great weekend and a week ahead. Thank you.